Father, we want to thank you so much for who you are and, and the way that you take such good care of us. You've allowed us to be here this morning, and we're thankful. And we want to praise your name for all your many blessings. Um, as we open your book, Lord, we pray that your spirit will be here to inspire us, to teach us, to guide and direct us. Uh, it's just ink on paper without the Holy Spirit, and so we need him to uh, set the truth home to our understanding and to guide and direct in our, <clears throat> in our conversation. So thank you for answering that prayer. Uh, we pray that if there are any others on the way, you bring them here safely, and you bless all those who are joining us online. We want to thank you that you're helping to fortify our minds with truth and understanding, and we pray we'll use it to your glory and honor. We ask it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. amen. Okay, so we're chapter eighteen. Chapter eighteen. Sorry, I can't put it up on the screen. My computer has decided it's time for a Windows update. Oh wow! <laughs> I can't even get the uh, chat mode up for until this finishes. Once I go back to my room. Okay. So right. chapter eighteen, counting my blessings, resorting to the little electronics now. Yeah. yeah. The surprise. That Sunday morning, ten o'clock appointment with my friend Roland had been a surprise for both of us. Is this one we did last week. Are you on 18? Yeah. I think we did 18 last week, didn't we? We did 18? I think we did. Somebody out there ought to know. Yes, I think it was. We did something else. Because then he wouldn't see Roland again. Right. <laughs> this is when he'd asked her to marry him and stuff, too. So oh, yeah. My, mine's, mine's a little off on here compared to where it is on this computer. Just where they got married was in the last one. There we are, walking under the shadow of death. There you go. Wow. Chapter 19. <laughs> Gets married, now he's walking under the shadow of death. Is there a connection? <laughs> it is not difficult to walk under Satan's shadow of death as long as the Lord of glory disperses that shadow with the bright rays of the spirit of life. While demon worshippers did not carry out any of their evil designs against me, demon spirits attempted to take my life in innumerable times over the years. Because of a deep sense of appreciation of the preciousness of life, prompted mainly by the fact that in the back of my mind has ever been present that declaration of a demon spirit that their attention would ever be focused upon me as a choice subject to exterminate. It has led me to raise my heart to God in thanksgiving as soon as I awake. <coughs> I have sought God's loving care over my wife and me along with our children and those early morning petitions have been heard and honored greatly over the past decades. For more than 20 years, the work has caused me to travel in cars anywhere between 30 to 40,000 miles per year, which has exposed me to the possibility <clears throat> of becoming part of the yearly statistics of highway fatalities. I've traveled in rainstorms, snowstorms, dense fog, and other unfavorable travel conditions. I've seen cars coming at me that were driven by drunks or individuals with their minds spaced out on drugs, persons whose minds were under the influence of demon spirits. But in answer to those early morning prayers, the Spirit of God blessed my mind a great many times, causing me to make the right move at the right time and thus escape destruction. I have had too many close calls to remember them all. But at this time I wish to recount a half dozen instances where I feel demon spirits were highly instrumental in working out what could have been the end of life for me, my wife, and children, and also for Cyril and Cynthia, just after my having been baptized into the commandment-keeping church. It was late March in the early 60s. We'd had a lot of snow that winter in western New York. In Wyoming County, especially around the Arcade region, snow plows had built up piles on either sides of the road reaching as high as 10 feet. The rigor of winter was beginning to abate as the sun was gaining strength and the days were getting longer. Global warming. Everyone was looking to better days ahead as nature was indicating a change to spring weather. One particular evening at about 9 o'clock, I was traveling a rural road in the vicinity of Rushford, New York, at a reasonable rate of speed, slowing down before entering turns in the road because it was impossible to see if any vehicles were coming around the corner because of the high snow banks. After a while, I suddenly came upon a stretch of road quite slippery because some of the snow had thawed during the day and the resulting water had frozen when the sun went down, leaving large patches of ice and making it impossible to reduce my speed by braking, 
because it would have been dangerous to lose control of the car. I touched neither the brake nor accelerator, but let the car roll into a sharp curve with the hope that nothing was coming around from the opposite direction. Around the curve I went, and then my eyes focused on the unbelievable. Across the road stood a large horse, and I had no choice but to hit the horse. By then the car had slowed down to about 20 miles per hour, but at any speed a person can be killed by running into such a large animal. Mm -hmm. One quick decision I had to make, which end of the horse should I drive into? <laughs> like other disasters I had encountered, I cried out, Dear Lord Jesus, please help. And instantly, without my thinking what to do, the car was steered into the direction of the front legs of the horse where I, when, when I was close to impact. The horse rose up on his hind legs, and I passed under the front ones, barely clearing the windshield on the top of my car. I was then able to bring the car around to a stop a short way down the road and give my pounding heart a couple of minutes to recover from that terrifying experience, and at the same time send forth a prayer of thanks to my precious Redeemer. Realizing the danger to other motorists encountering that horse, I drove to the first house down the road to see if it was theirs. Having told the man of the, ho of the house the details of my encounter and describing the animal, he informed me that it was undoubtedly the neighbors and was kept indoors during the winter months. He picked up the phone and rang the owner to inform him that his horse was out of the barn. <coughs> After he hung up the phone, he stated that the farmer was going to check on the horse who was seen in his stall about a half hour before. And at the time the man had completed his evening chores, he would call right back. A few minutes later, the phone rang and the message came, the stall door was wide open and the horse was gone. The farmer couldn't figure out how the horse had gotten out. I understood. And again, my heart was lifted up in prayer of thanksgiving to God for his tender care over a most undeserving human being. In December of 1971, I was working on the, on the telephone directory of Watertown, New York. A few mornings had been exceedingly cold for that time of year, and I wanted to reassure myself that my die-hard battery would not fail to start in the, next, in the morning. So I proceeded to the Sears and Roebuck Auto Department to have someone check that battery out. We haven't heard anybody refer to Sears and Roebuck in a long time. It <laughs> really dates him, doesn't yeah. it? It was a busy morning in the service department, and it took a while before someone could attend to my needs. Being unable to bring the car indoors as the bays were full, the service manager brought a tester out to the car, performed the needed check, and assured me that the battery would carry me through the winter without problems. Meanwhile, a large tractor trailer loaded with 27 tons of cargo had been parked right behind my car, and the driver had gone into the store to get unloading instructions. My car was facing the building and I couldn't get out. At the time I was driving a small Saab, a Model 96. The fellow had checked my battery, who checked my battery, suggested that I f back under the body of the trailer because there was sufficient room to do so and he would guide me in my move. It sounded like an excellent suggestion. The truck motor was turned off and the brakes were well engaged, otherwise it would have rolled down the hill because the parking lot was on a steep incline. Getting into the car, I started the motor, placed the gear shift in reverse, and slowly backed under that huge cargo box. I was backed up as far as I needed to, and the man was motioning me to steer to the left and out, when suddenly I sensed that same feeling of urgency that in times past had led me clear of destruction so many times. I quickly placed the car in first gear and shot right back into that parking space, but not fast enough to avoid being hit by a wheel of the truck that knocked out the the light off the end of one of the rear fenders. I jumped out of the car in time to see that huge truck racing backwards down the hill, colliding with cars and jackknifing to a stop as it demolished the back half of a large Chrysler. Hey, the driver of the truck appeared on the scene in time to see his vehicle hit that last car. He couldn't believe his eyes. He declared with great earnestness that he had the truck in forward gear and the emergency or parking brakes were on and well secured. The owner of that last damaged automobile was furious. He and his wife had gotten out of the car about two minutes before the accident took place and were walking up to the store when they saw it all happen. He began to accuse the truck driver of being many things unflattering, including being an idiot for leaving a truck standing without the parking brake on, and he was going to check out those brakes there and then. 
The driver refused to let anyone enter the cab of the truck and stayed out of it himself until the police could get there and make a report. A few minutes later, the police arrived, and after listening to an account of what had taken place, one of the officers climbed into the cab of the truck and looked over the controls. All present listened attentively to the officer, who, having a clipboard in one hand and a pen in the other, began to write his findings. One, ignition switch off. Gear shift in neutral position. Parking brake secured. Red light on instrument panel indicating brake on when the ignition switch is turned on. Four, malfunction inexplicable. The police officer came down from the cab asking to talk to the individual whose car was hit first. As I stepped forward stating that I, I was he, the officer went out saying, did I hear the service manager correctly that he advised you to back your car under that trailer? Yes, officer. It was an unwise move on my part, and I shouldn't have done it. Having asked for my driver's license, and as he was writing down the information needed, he said, Mr. Morneau, you are very fortunate to be alive. I am sure you are aware that one second longer under that truck, and you would not be here making that accident report. That little car of yours would have been flattened to the pavement with you in it. Some people are just plain lucky, and I see you are one of those. <coughs> Sir, I am thankful to God for his protecting care over me. This is one of many instances in which my life has been preserved. He handed me back my driver's license, saying, Let me shake your hand for good luck. Maybe some of your good fortune will rub off on me. As I got into my car, I asked the Lord to bless that officer's life with his tender, loving care and to benefit his life in the manner in which he had benefited mine and to save him into his eternal kingdom. As for myself, again I thought back to 1946 and the conversation I had had with a spirit counselor who had declared that demon spirits are experts in bringing misery and destruction into the lives of poor mortals, and the days of my life would be but few. At the same time, the Spirit of God had blessed my mind with the assurance that if one paints the doorpost with the blood of Calvary's lamb, he or she can rest in perfect peace from the hand of the destroyer. Good illustration, isn't it? <clears throat> Yet once again, Satan's shadow of death had come very close to me, but the bright rays of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had dispersed that shadow in a moment of time. As I drove away, my heart was lifted up to my heavenly <clears throat> Father in thanksgiving for the power of his love having operated so marvelously in my behalf, and for a fresh manifestation of his interest and care that was sure to accompany me through the remainder of my pilgrimage through the land of the enemy. I was working on a telephone directory in the eastern part of New York State because a great many business people had taken off that beautiful Wednesday afternoon of July. I found myself making appointments with secretaries to handle the firm's yellow page advertising the following day. Thursday was going to be a real busy day working on a tight schedule. I rose a bit earlier that morning because I had to work in a phone call to a contractor at 6.30 to set a time convenient to meet with him because he was working on a project out of town and was difficult to meet up with. During that conversation, the man informed me that I should see him an hour later at 7.30 because his work was taking him away for two weeks. I agreed to see him at the time mentioned and closed the conversation. From that moment on, it was rush, rush, rush. My devotion time was shortened with the thought of catching up with it after that first appointment. What I figured would be a straight renewal of advertising turned out to be quite lengthy. The firm had acquired a new logo and the cuts in their ads needed to be replaced with more up-to-date ones, plus many changes had to be made in the copy. Those changes having been made, I realized that in a few minutes I should be at my next appointment, which was about five minutes away. I reasoned that if I could cancel that one appointment and reset it for late afternoon or the following day, I would then have time to return to the motel, have my usual devotions, and get myself some breakfast. So I asked for the use of the phone and called what was in reality the first appointment of the day. After getting the owner on the line, I explained that something had come up that made it difficult for me to see him at the time set the day before with his secretary and could I reset our meeting to another time that would be convenient for him? His reply was that he himself had changed his schedule for that day to accommodate the time set with me by his secretary, and he would wait for me even if I were late getting there. I'll see you in a short while, I said, and hung up the phone. 
Being mindful of keeping to the speed limit, I proceeded to the meeting, losing no time getting there, again hoping to be able to reset the following appointment. Having attended to the advertising needs of this customer, I asked to use his phone and called my next scheduled customer, and who was faced again with having to keep the appointment. I asked for directions on how to get to his place of business, thanked him and hung up. I got into my car and took off, keeping my mind on the landmarks he said to watch for and the names of the roads to turn onto. It meant traveling over a few hills in order to get to that valley. Taking a quick look at the road map, I felt the man had given me a roundabout way of getting to his place. The directions consisted of state roads, which were probably the ideal way to travel there, but I thought I could use some secondary roads and shorten the distance to save time. Stopping at a service station, I asked if there were any shorter ways of getting to my destination. Yes, there is, said the attendant. If you go about one mile down this road and take a left turn on County Road number blank, whatever this is, it will get you over the hills without any problem. It's a good road, paved all the way. Having spoken those words, he looked up into the sky and said, It looks like we may get a shower or two. Look at those angry clouds billowing up. If it rains while you're traveling that way, be careful of the turns in the road. Some of them have no guardrails. So I thanked him and left. About ten minutes later, it started to rain with such intensity that I had to stop and wait for the downpour to end. A short while later, as suddenly as it had begun, the rain stopped. I proceeded down the road with caution, enjoying the response of my new automobile and its quick acceleration, and my, after my having reduced the speed considerably to negotiate some of the turns in the road. Then suddenly I experienced strange actions on the part of my car. I was on level ground, coming to a bend in the road, broken up by a bridge with no guardrails securing its entrance. A road sign with the familiar arrow indicating a sharp bend suggested 30 miles per hour as a safe speed to observe. Because of the wet pavement, I was careful making that turn, moving at 20 miles per hour to be doubly safe. As I entered the bend, steering the car to the right, it didn't respond but continued straight ahead. I slammed on the brakes with great force. I felt them taking hold, but the car didn't slow down. As a couple of the wheels slid off the pavement onto the shoulder of the road, the brakes locked completely. The rolling of the gravel and the squealing of rubber on the pavement made a terrifying noise and I realized that the car was being pushed by some invisible force. I shouted, Dear Jesus, please help. Instantly the car stopped, and as I sat perfectly still for a few minutes thinking about my predicament, I wondered how could I get out of the car without making it go <coughs> over the edge to a rocky riverbed some 50 feet below. From where I was, I couldn't tell how close, to the, how close the front wheels were from sliding down the embankment but what I could see of my environment indicated it was too close for me to be comfortable just sitting there. Leaving the motor running, I put the gear shift in park, secured the emergency brake, and slowly opened the door and got out of the car. What a near disaster I was looking upon. Another 10 inches and the front wheel on the driver's side would have been in the void, and I could imagine the car tumbling down to the riverbed with my being in it. In a very careful way, I got back in the car, left the door open, and backed up my vehicle to safe ground. I then lifted my heart to God in thanksgiving for the power of his love and grace. That incident served to make me mindful once again of the fact that my supernatural enemies weren't giving up on their intentions to bring me to an early grave. On the other hand, it reinforced my conviction that the superior power of my precious Redeemer was ever present to assure me shelter and deliverance from the hand of the destroyer. I got up at four o'clock that morning to go to work. It being late fall, I took a quick look outside to see if there was any fog to contend with that day. We were living only three miles from the Letchworth State Park, better known to some people as the Grand Canyon of the East. The huge gorge cradles the Genesee River, which at times can be a cause of dense fog covering the valley for miles. Yes, my fears were confirmed. Fog had developed. The mercury light spreading its illumination over our yard seemed to do only half of its capacity. The fog was dense and uninviting. Closing the door, I decided to take a few additional minutes for morning devotions. At about 
I took off, regardless of the fog, and prompted mainly by a declaration of scripture, he that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap, Ecclesiastes 11.4. Now that, that's a verse well worth taking a second look at. I didn't think I would have ever interpreted it that way. And I felt that fog had a similar application here as relating to my earning a living. Proceeding down the road at about 40 miles per hour, I tried to exercise prudence in keeping a speed that would allow the car to stop readily if something unexpected happened. Above all, my reliance upon God's loving care was reassuring and afforded me a measure of safety as I came to rely upon under a measure of safety that I came to rely upon under unfavorable conditions such as experienced that morning. Like many times before, in driving to work in snowstorms or fog, I asked my great high priest, Christ Jesus, to bless my mind by the power of his grace and with a sense of oncoming danger, were I in a position of driving into a vehicle or anything that would involve me in an accident. Having the headlights dimmed and my eyes focused on that reflecting center line assured me of being on the right side of the road. I was heading east on Route 70 with the intention of getting on the southbound expressway at Hornell, New York. Of highest importance in all my concerns was the intersection of Route 70 and 36, called a death trap by the natives. Route 70 terminates in Route 36 with no great effort having been put forth on the part of the highway department to let people know that a very dangerous situation could develop for motorists in that intersection. Many accidents had taken place there in the past because of rain or snow, making the pavement slippery, and vehicles slamming into the side of the hill, not having had enough time to slow down to make the stop, indicated by an ordinary sign saying stop ahead. Coming out of the village of Canarasaga? Canasaraga. I won't even try that again. I accelerated from the local speed to about 35 miles per hour and held it there, knowing that about three miles ahead was that dangerous intersection. I wanted to make double sure that I saw the small sign indicating the stop ahead. The fog wasn't getting any lighter and all my attention was centered on my driving when a large black dog approached my automobile and seemingly without effort kept pace with the front fender of the driver's side. It seemed as if that dog wanted to race the car as he would proceed a few feet ahead and then slow down to allow the car to catch up with him. What strange dog, I thought. He had the body of a greyhound and the tail of an Irish setter, and could he ever run? At that moment, the dog was about six feet ahead of my, har, my car and turned his head to see how far back my car was. I decided to see just how fast that dog could run, and the speedometer began to climb. 37, 39, 42, and the dog didn't seem to mind the added speed. By then I lost all thought of what was ahead. Pressing a little harder on the accelerator, the speed reached 44, 45, 47, and then my mind was seized with a sense of oncoming danger that was terrifying as the Spirit of God brought me back to reality. I slammed on the brakes as hard as I could to slow down my car. Then I saw the stop sign and cried out, Dear Jesus, but I didn't even have the time to say, please help. With the four wheels locked, I skidded across Route 36 and came to a stop, facing a solid wall of dirt. I put the gear shift in reverse and quickly backed up out of the way and said a few words of prayer of thanksgiving to my Lord and Savior. An angel of God must have stopped the car for me because it would have been humanly impossible to slow down and stop an automobile that way. Oh yeah, the dog? He vanished when the help from on high moved in. Sounds like he has some serious ADHD. <laughs> oh, a dog. Hey, a dog. Let's go race a dog in the fog. <laughs> well, if he can run 47 miles an hour, you know. It's pretty impressive, yeah. Yeah. He's a fast dog. Three weeks later, under similar fog conditions, a man died on that same spot when his tractor trailer loaded with milk slammed into the side of that hill. On the Sabbath following my near disaster, I had the 11 o'clock service at the Adventist Church in Wayland, New York. Once in a while, our minister who pastored three churches would have one of his local elders deliver the 11 o'clock message to the congregations. In my travel to Wayland, I had to cover the same stretch of road, which by now had become a monumental reminder 
of what the Lord had done to save me from the hand of the destroyer. As I made the required stop at that intersection and saw the heavy tire marks left by my car on the pavement, realizing how close I had come to being killed, a deeper sense of appreciation of the goodness of the Lord was felt, and the joy of counting my blessings on that Sabbath was increased greatly. That morning I shared the joy of my experience with God's Sabbath-keeping people, who rejoiced with me at the thought that in this day and age, we have the blessed assurance that the Lord is concerned with the well-being of his commandment-keeping pe people. In our home, my wife Hilda and I have established the principle of family devotions from the beginning of our married life, and our three children have the benefit of being brought up hearing daily some of the great stories of the Bible that show God's loving care for those that call upon his name. Without trying to scare our children into serving the Lord, we have brought to them awareness or a sense of understanding of the fact that we are in our lifetimes pilgrims traveling through the land of the enemy. Also that we should always be conscious of the fact that forces are at work to separate us from God and work out our destruction. If demon spirits can't separate us from the Lord, their frustration then turns into bitterness and hatred, which motivates them to seek a means of bringing harm or even death to the Christian. An understanding of those factors has helped us all to seek God's grace and care early each morning, and many have been the manifestations of God's redeeming grace in our lives over the years. I'd like to illustrate this by recounting a short experience that happened to my wife and our daughter Linda in 1962. It was late in the fall of the year, and unusually <clears throat> high winds had stripped the trees completely of their leaves and brought down from the Arctic Circle those unwelcome currents of air that had the ability to penetrate flesh and chill to the bone. Arriving home from school one day, Linda's first words to her mother after closing the kitchen door were, I can't stand that cold wind, and to make matters worse, the weatherman is forecasting an abundance of chilling rain for tomorrow. I wish I lived in the tropics. <laughs> Her mother, prompted by acquired knowledge gained from many years of living through some very cold seasons, suggested that the young lady proceed to an upstairs closet where comfortable clothing had been stored a few months back and reacquaint herself with the art of making oneself comfortable. <laughs> the suggestion was heeded and for a while seemed to be satisfactory until Linda appeared in the kitchen with a woolen skirt that refused to be brought down to the knee and with a heavy-duty raincoat whose sleeves appeared to have shrunk in two or three inches. Modeling these items for her mother, Linda stated there was nothing wrong with the garments except she had grown too tall for them. So without hesitation, it was decided that a bit of shopping was in order. Getting in the car, they proceeded in the direction of the big city of Buffalo. At the time, our residence was in Couriers, New York. At about 7 p.m., Returning home from their shopping trip, they encountered a bad rainstorm that battered the village of East Aurora with high winds for about two hours, leaving broken trees and branches everywhere. Visibility was poor because of the darkness and driving rain. As they left the village at a moderate rate of speed, they kept watching for the unexpected. After a while, Linda saw what appeared to be a man waving his arms in a motion to stop. Realizing what was taking place, she yelled to her mother, Watch out for that telephone pole! Hilda slammed on the brakes just in time to avoid hitting the pole, full, or having the pole fall on top of them. It ended up hitting a front corner of the car and damaging the bumper and fender. So the pole was in the process of falling. According to the neighbors, some linemen had set the telephone pole up that same day and having additional work to do had left without securing it properly. The high winds and heavy rain had caused it to shift out of place and it toppled over. And were it not for God's tender loving care over the ladies, my loss would have been very great that day. As I mentioned earlier, demon spirits had determined that Cyril and Cynthia's lives should be short, shortly brought to an end for the part they had played in breaking my affiliation with the Spirit Society. In order not to worry my young friends, I had refrained from letting them know what the spirits had purposed to do to them. But every morning I brought their need of protection before the Lord, placing them under his loving care. And every Sabbath day, as I counted my blessings and rejoiced in the goodness of the Lord, which I am still doing, I never failed to thank the Master for his having held back the power of the destroyer from touching any one of us. 
that carefree and joyous experience continued for about six months. And then for some reason that we cannot explain in this present world, the Lord allowed a calamity to take place in the lives of Cyril and Cynthia, which brought great distress to them and almost cost Cynthia her life. Demon spirits seized upon a bit of human carelessness. Having close, come close to death a number of times has led me to believe such experiences are allowed to take place to keep a person mindful that their invisible enemies are ever ready to seize upon opportunities to end their life. It has a sobering influence on the mind that makes it impossible to take life for granted. And above all, it draws one closer to his or her redeemer. A unique, unique fire took place in my young friend's residence, the account of which I'll bring to you in Cyril's own words. We need to know a little bit about the setting of that living room where these precious Bible studies took place. The lines that follow are a continuation of Cyril's written account mentioned at the end of chapter 11. When Roger requested Bible studies for that very night, I went home and got out my brief Bible readings for busy people, and we prepared the living room so we would be comfortable. Since Cynthia and I loved good music, we decided our guests should be greeted with soft music in the background. From our first meeting, I decided not to use heavy church music as I didn't want to scare him off by causing him to think we only played church music seven days a week. We do play fine classical music, and it was decided on that October night when Roger entered, he would hear the soft strains of Ravel's Bolero playing on our large radio record player combination. As he entered, he seemed tense, however. He liked the music and made a comment to that effect. After introductions, we sat down and relaxed, and after a while, turned the music off and started our studies. Roger was like a hungry man starving to death, but his hunger was for the word of God, and of course, we were delighted at his desire. Roger has stated how the evil one tried to do him harm. Without realizing what was happening, we had a few frightful experiences also, one almost took the life of my wife, Cynthia. After Roger was baptized one afternoon, my, after Roger was baptized, one afternoon my wife and I were in the same room that we were given those most important Bible studies when my brother-in-law decided to test the volatility of some cleaning fluid we had. He neglected to cover the can and in seconds the room was in flames. Cynthia was trapped behind a wall of flame, her only escape being through a window but that was a drop of three stories that probably would have been fatal. My brother, 11 or 12 years old, ran to call the fire department as I ran to another room to get a blanket to beat the flames in order to save my wife. And in so doing, I yelled for her to back away from the flames. When I returned seconds later, the spot where Cynthia stood had exploded with such force that a hole was blown through the ceiling and the floor where she stood was burning with red flames. The phonograph that I had played the music, beautiful music on that first Bible study was reduced to ashes. I looked at the flaming room and realized that Cynthia was standing outside beside me looking at the flames. The blanket I had thrown was in ashes. Cynthia told me that something had told her to jump. Her jump, which I am convinced was guided by the angels, carried her over the flames of that large radio to safety. The ends of the hair on her head were singed, her eyelashes were burned, but no skin on her body had been touched by the flames. After the firemen put out the flames, we checked the room to see how much was lost. We found that everything in the room was burned. In a closet, we had a suitcase with clothing inside. That suitcase was not touched by the flames, yet some of the clothing in the center was in ashes, while the rest of the clothing was intact. I attributed my wife's deliverance to the grace of God and to his promises, one of which is Psalm 91, because thou hast made the Lord which is thy refuge, even the most high thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Because he has set his love upon thee, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. My wife's mother taught her this beautiful psalm when she was very young, and today she still rejoices in its wonderful promise. It encourages my heart to review briefly some of the instances that have served to keep me mindful of the great conflict continually going on between invisible agencies, the great controversy between the forces of good and evil. 
The superior power of our great Redeemer, preciously manifested in these instances, serves to confirm the decision I made in 1946, prompted by the Bible studies received in that one week. Those were indeed sound and wise ones. God is in verity my refuge and strength, and a very present help in trouble. <clears throat> Long now, chapter. This, this is the last chapter coming up soon. Long chapter there. And the uh, reason why it was long is because of the subject. Um, you know, almost every day you could probably think of um, a potential hazard that God has saved us from. Um, I mean, my mind went to Lamentations chapter 3. I'll just read a couple of verses here. It said, um, Says, this I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Talking about the Lord's faithfulness to protect us. Uh, how often? Thank you. Every single day. Every single day the Lord protects us. Um, we, how how many times do we recognize we, that? Right, well, I'm saying we probably take that for granted almost as much as lots of other things. But uh, it's only when something spectacular comes along that we recognize, like, you know, rolling a vehicle or, you know, having a fire in the house or Why something like that. Why did you point at me when you said that? <laughs> you know, it, it's uh, things that, that um, you know, happen on a regular basis that, that could very easily uh, cause death and destruction. But anyway, we do take a lot for granted, and of course this chapter is a reminder that, that uh, not only are there things that take place that we would consider normal, but we also have an enemy bent on our destruction, right? And so God has to protect us from that as well every single day. He has to put a hedge around us and keep us, because if the enemy had his way, what would he do? In a minute. He'd get rid of everybody, especially any Christian. He didn't like us. Yeah, he would get rid. He, he would, doesn't like that influence in the world. So, uh, so anyway, um, good chapter. We could talk a little bit about it. <clears throat> Time to get on to our study. All right, um, we're in chapter six of Revelation, right? Mm -hmm. Getting a little bored here. Getting bored out here. Is this too close to you? I put this together because I wanted to uh, do a little review since Ken missed last week, number one. And uh, it's good for us to kind of see as we go through um, chapter six of Revelation. How, how everything kind of ties together. And, and, and that's really what we're looking for. We're looking for, um, <clears throat> we're looking for harmony through all the different aspects of what's introduced there in the book. Okay. Um, and so just for the sake of review, uh, we can go ahead and you can help me fill in these particular answers. Right? Um, Last week, we, uh, in our last two weeks, we talked about, of course, the horses, and a lot of sermons have been preached on the, uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, as it's been called. And what's the traditional view that most people have with the horsemen of the apocalypse? And this is the, it involves the opening of the seals. The seals are being opened. Okay. What's the traditional viewpoint? They represented... Uh like major events or groups of peoples and, you know, like Attila the Hun and stuff like that. The events in history. Yeah, the events of history. Attila the Hun, I think, is actually attributed to the trumpets. But the seals, remember we talked about uh, Victorinus, a guy named Victorinus in the third century? Yeah. He was uh, credited with uh, the first person to really do a commentary on the book of Revelation. And he came up with a, a thought 
which is a good thought of, of uh, repeat and enlarge. You've heard us talk about that, where a concept is introduced in Scripture, and then in another part of Scripture it's repeated, but it's enlarged to some extent. You know, if you really do an analysis with um, this, the traditional view on the seals, you don't really have that enlargement process um, expounded on tremendously. What you do have uh, really stipulated is a repeat process. And so Victorinus was the first one to really come up with the idea or theory that the message to the seven churches, chapter 2 and 3, and the, the, uh, the seals in chapter 5 and 6, and the trumpets in chapter uh, 8 and 9, and even one in 11, chapter 11, uh, they all cover a period of history, church history. Okay? Remember one of the applications we talked about for the seven churches was that, that not only were these seven literal churches, but the, the concept or the message to that congregation applied to the condition of the church in this period of time and then in this period of time, and then in this period of time, all the way up till Laodicea, which would be um, the uh, end of time, basically the last church, last church period. Okay. Now, Victorinus came along and he said, well, the seals do the same thing. They, they apply to this period of time. And this, so for example, the, the first period was the Ephesus period, right? And so the opening of the first seal would apply to the same period of time. All right, so that that's, gives you an idea how they uh, did that. So as we go through these, that's the traditional view. But what we're looking for is not just application. We're looking for what? What's important now, I believe, because of the time that we're living in? Uh, and, of course, the book of Revelation really emphasizes this, for the time is at hand. Uh, the beginning of the book and the end of the book. And so uh, the contents of the, the whole book really, the ultimate fulfillment, uh, which is the Hebrew exegesis, that really applies to, I think, something more specific. And what's that more specific thing that we've been making the application to? Future. Pardon me? Future events. Well, not future events, but the person of Jesus himself. And, and that follows with the context established in the first five words. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ, right? So several chapters of the book, the first six chapters, really, I believe, the ultimate fulfillment, even though you can make many applications, the ultimate fulfillment is directed toward the Messiah and what he would do. What, the, what would be the Messiah's mission? Okay, that kind of thing. And so as we go through the horsemen here, we're, we, we've, we've considered that the application puts it in different time periods. Uh, but the ultimate fulfillment really is an application to Christ himself. And so the first horse is a white horse. And since I didn't have a white marker and it's a white board, I just left it blank. Okay? So it's a white horse, right? The white that? horse was first? Yes. Yeah, the first horse. I thought it was the red one. No, that was the second one. Okay. So we, we're there in Revelation chapter 6. Uh, you got four horsemen there. What happened to the pale horse? Okay, just a sec. It says, we'll, we'll go through it together. It says, I saw that the, la the lamb opened one of the seals. And that's something that we've been emphasizing, right? Who is the one only that can open these seals? Christ okay, Jesus. Okay, it's only the lamb. the lamb that can open these seals. So that, again, is a clue that says, really, the ultimate understanding is connected to him directly. Okay. If he is the only one that can open the seal, in other words, no event in history, no group of people, no Christian uh, church, you know, there's no, uh, you know, no Pope of Rome, there's no emperor, you know, there's no person, no event in history. And that's typically where the application goes. It goes to uh, some events, some persons in, in history that are opening the seals. The book says the Lamb opens the seals. Okay. So I think that's a clue tying it directly to him. Uh, we talked last couple of weeks about the white horse. And he that sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him, etc. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, um, 
<clears throat> since I don't have a white marker, <laughs> we'll just talk about um, a couple of different things. You notice I've got the color of the horses, the angel creatures. Now, who are the angel creatures? The four beings. Okay, now why have I listed them? I've listed them because it says here, and I heard one of the four living creatures. I'm, I'm putting down all the, the aspects and components of what's in the process of opening these seals. So you've got the colors of the horse, you've got the angel creatures, you've got the rider on the horse. Revelation 5.12, why do I put that down there? Revelation 5.12 are the corresponding words. I think these again are clues, right? Clues 5.12. Worthy is who? Worthy the is lamb. the Lamb to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. So there's seven particular key words there that I think are clues. And then what's the main focus that we can identify in this process of these seals being opened? And how does that relate to Messiah's mission? All right. So they're the things that we're looking at. So since we don't have a white marker here, this is the first... Who, who was the first uh, angelic being? These are listed over in chapter 4, actually. They're identified in chapter 4 of Revelation. You got um, uh, in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. The first living creature was like a... Like a what? Like a lion. Like a lion. Okay, I'm just going to write them down here. So, okay, so th this is what I want you guys to do is, is fill these out, all right? Who's the rider on the first horse there? The rider's really not identified, is he? Okay, no. it just it says he one set, right? Or he used set. He's a, war he's a warrior or a ruler. <coughs> okay. Um, so he's really not identified, so I'm just going to put, uh, you know, kind of N-I, right? He's not identified uh, specifically, right? Even though he's on a white horse, we know that he's wearing a crown on his head, and he has a bow, and we all initially thought that that bow was part of a bow and arrow, but it's not part of a bow and arrow, is it? It's more like a flag or a banner. Okay, it's more like a banner. You know, a victory's banner, a victory banner, like like uh, you know, somebody would, would 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 carry that kind of thing. What was the what's the first word in Revelation five twelve that we were looking at here? And they sang his song. Power, power, right? Okay. Now, what's the what do, what's the main focus of this for, o opening seal that we talked about the last couple of weeks? And again, I'm just reviewing this for Ken. What's the main thing that, that, that you get out of this opening of this first seal? He's wearing a white horse. Okay, but that's about so you're wearing a white, riding a white horse. <laughs> he's in the horse. That'd be pretty tough. Okay, he's riding a white horse. So that denotes purity, right? No. Purity. And it says that he goes forth, he's carrying the banner, and he goes Conqueror forth to what? He's a conqueror, right? Right. Okay, he's a conqueror. Okay. Um, now, how would how did that apply? How would that apply to the mission of the Messiah? Uh, is victory or the temptation in the wilderness? Okay, the Messiah would have to be pure, right? Righteous. Holy. In fact, again, with the last couple of weeks we looked at some of these scriptures. First Timothy uh, three sixteen. You know, he was just Christ. Christ came justified in the Spirit, etc. And then he would live an exemplary life, which was the process of sanctification. And all be, all through the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Okay, because he's a human being, but he's living through the power. He's maintaining that connection with heaven, living. <clears throat> so he too would live a victorious life, right? <clears throat> he would have complete victory in his life uh, as an example. But not only as an example, not only as an example, his right doing would be able to do what? To redeem 
Yeah, his right doing, his righteousness would be able to redeem humanity. Okay? Because he's the he's the second Adam, right? Right? He's the second Adam. You can put it up here. He, the first Adam failed. Here comes the second Adam. In actually a uh, disadvantaged condition. But he becomes a conqueror. He becomes victorious through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so you see how we're doing that, right? Okay, now last week we talked about the red horse. Who was the, uh, who was the angel creature? Who was the angel creature there? Back in Revelation chapter 4, the first one was like a lion. The second one was like a calf or an ox. It almost makes me think of the red heifer. Right? Yeah, the red heifer. Okay. Very important. Okay. How about the rider on that red horse? Again, we this is what we did. This is what we went through last week, Ken. The rider on the red horse. Take peace War. from the earth. Right. Yeah. That's the one I thought we had, had to boom. Right. You open the second seal. I heard the second living creature say, the one that had the ox, come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out. It was granted to the one who sat on it. So again, that rider is not identified, right? Specifically. Right? Not identified. <clears throat> to take peace from the earth, and that, and that should, uh, and that people should, he said, People's yeah, applied word there should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. Okay, so we talked all about that last week. Who who wants to summarize what what that main focus was? In fact, what was the key word? What was the key word there? Revelation five twelve. What's the key word there? Riches, power, riches. Right. So we got riches. And what's the what was the main focus there? Let's see what I wrote down here. Okay. <clears throat> Alright, so he, he, he takes peace from the earth. That is a perfect description. And we looked at a scripture. Um, I can't remember exactly where it was. I don't have, have the notes from last week. But remember we looked at the scripture. I think it was Matthew. It was Matthew 12? What was it? Where, where it's talking about when Christ came uh, and confronted the world, he took peace. You know, in fact, what the scriptures say, think not that I've come to bring peace, peace. but a sword. Okay? And, and what, we talked about that last week in, what, in ex the components of, of uh, how that happens. Why does Christ's ministry, when he, when he starts to, his ministry, why does his ministry take peace from the earth? Because truth is the sword. <clears throat> Pardon me? Because truth is the sword. Okay, because truth is the sword. Right, truth is the word. It's the sword. It's uh, when, when light comes into darkness, you have, con you have uh, <clears throat> controversy, conflict, right? Uh, one against another. Warring for the control, warring for mastery. And... Just like in our story, um, <clears throat> you know, what he has found out is that, man, there's a great war going on for the souls of humanity. And it, it, humanity is kind of caught in the middle of this supernatural conflict. Okay? But, but here, an ox is a, is a representation of a ministry of a servant. You know, uh, an ox is, serves humanity. And so here, Messiah's mission would be to serve. Remember we talked, he would... His ministry went on the last 1260 days, right? But the main mission, mission here was his, uh, his, <clears throat> his uh, human ministry of service. Yeah, basically. Right. <clears throat> Who are the riches? Remember we talked about the riches? How do riches play into it? Is that the uh, souls of the saved? Or? Yeah, the, the riches would be the, all Us. the redeemed. You know, all the redeemed that would, would make a choice for life instead of a choice for death. Okay? The main focus here really is, is, is conviction and confrontation, right?
So, okay, uh, I got the end there anyway. Confrontation. All right, so Christ's ministry of truth, remember he kept telling the people, you know, uh, <clears throat> my kingdom is not of this world, etc. They had different ideas and theories the Jews had developed. And he came to clarify, not only clarify to reveal the character of his father, but also to restore that character in humanity. And of course that, that would mean taking them away from the grip that the power of darkness had, had in, in them, you see. So you've got that kind of playing out. All right, so that, that's all kind of review. <coughs> and if you uh, <clears throat> need to, if you're, if you're watching new today, you can go back and uh, look at one of the archive programs from uh, the last week or two. So now we're kind of stepping into new territory here um, with, the next, with the next horse, and that's uh, the third seal. Somebody want to read that? This is Revelation 6, 5. 5 and 6. I'll read it. 5 and 6. Go ahead. Uh, and when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Okay, so we've got a black horse here, right? Mm -hmm. All right. And what's the, uh, <clears throat> what's the corresponding <clears throat> angel creature? It's like a man. Okay, so you got a man. All right. All right. And we'll, we'll see how that, well, how that becomes significant here in a little bit. <clears throat> How about the rider on this horse? <clears throat> not really identified for this one either. Okay, he's not really, <clears throat> not really specifically identified. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what's our <clears throat> word in Revelation 5.12? Wisdom. <clears throat> Wisdom. <clears throat> okay. So this rider would have to have incredible wisdom and insight, right? Um, the main focus, what's going on in this particular, with this particular horse? <clears throat> Does it have to do anything with justice? Why, why do you say that? Because I was thinking of the balances, kind of like how we have the liberty holding the scale or the balance between... Between, right, okay. okay. <clears throat> so, the main focus are the balances, right? Justice. Okay. Actually, that one should be up further. Where about it? Okay. Balances, justice, and he goes on to say he had a pair of scales in his hand or balances. I heard the voice in the midst of the four living creatures: a quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. So we want to unpack that, right? Um, if we think about Messiah's mission and the fact that he had, uh, he came on the scene, he was pure, he was holy, he went into the wilderness of temptation, uh, led by the Spirit there, and he came out a complete conqueror. And then, he, of course, that's the beginning of his, uh, his uh, earthly ministry as rabbi and Messiah. And then um, he, he enters a situation, he enters a situation really depicted by this black horse. <clears throat> and he does it as a man, which is, which is really uh, of, of tremendous significance. Now let me share with you, <clears throat> because I've written a little article on this. Let me share with you, <clears throat> and see if this makes sense to you. It says, the next horse to make his appearance in this, cha in this ch chapter 6 here is the black horse. 
<clears throat> the loosening of the third seal. Black is a color that denotes darkness. <clears throat> okay. The absence of light. The third word is, of course, the word wisdom. Now, near the close of Christ's earthly ministry, he would go through an experience in the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay? An experience like none other. This would be his own personal time of trouble, like never was. Okay? Now, why would that be a time of trouble that, that never was for him as he goes to Gethsemane? And the Father would turn his back. Okay, his father starts drawing away from him, from him because he, he there becomes sin for us. And so sin is also denoted by darkness, the absence of light. All right? And so <clears throat> here he is as a man going through this scripted period of darkness. And we really can't, we really have no clue... <coughs> Uh, how intense this was, except for the fact that physiologically he's under such stress and strain from what's happening here, what's, what's taking place, that he starts to sweat blood. Now, why is that significant? Because something called hematidrosis doesn't occur unless you are really What's happening there is the capillaries in your skin are bursting from the stress and the strain of what you're dealing with. Okay? And he was a, physically, he was a strong person. He was a strong person physically. He was in really good shape physically. And yet, he's under such stress here. And he's going through a situation, even as a man, that he's never experienced before. Because what had he always told his disciples? Yeah, the Father and I, we are one. We're one. We're close. We're you know we're we're always together. We're always communicating. But he knew he'd be separated. Okay. Or? Now he's he's sensing this separation that's occurring. This darkness that is just enveloping him. Okay. Um, we can't quite understand this because his existence with the Father is eternal in the in the entire past. Okay. And even as a man, his whole life, he's been connected um, and close to the Father. In fact, the Father uh, kind of sets his agenda day by day. So, he, he, you know, when you go through Scripture, it's some of the verses that you can look at, particularly in the book of John. There's this, there's this uh, he, he knows what the will of the Father is, and he only does those things according to the will of the Father. I mean, there's this, this incredible relationship that he has. It says, One cool evening in a solitude garden, Messiah is distressed. He senses his Father pulling away, veiling himself from his view. He's now becoming sin for humanity. This is a terrible time of darkness, a darkness from which there seems no escape, no hope. Uh, in fact, you can sense, uh, particularly in the Gospel of Matthew, you can sense his consternation here because what does he ask the father on three separate occasions as he's praying yeah if it's possible can you take this cup from me right but he says not my will but thy will okay so his will would have been is there another way to do this i i don't want to go through this separation i don't want to experience this this is this is this is like going down a deep, dark hole, right? From which there seems no escape. All right. Now we find Christ at this hour in a place of solitude. Okay, Gethsemane. It's a, it's a place that they normally went to to relax, to get away from the day's activities. It was a peaceful place. Uh, it's it's on the the uh, hillside. The Mount of Olives is on the hillside there. It's a, it's a olive grove. But on this occasion, at this moment, no such comfort will be found. In fact, he is sorrowful in his own word. He said, I sorrow even unto yeah. death. I am exceedingly, he says, exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. In, in his mind, I don't think in his own mind, he thought that he was going to be leaving that place alive. I don't think he, he believed he was going to get out of there. Now... Gethsemane. What does anybody know what the word? This is the Garden of Gethsemane. A couple of references in Scripture. 
Uh, we know that the garden is there, still there today, the Mount of Olives, uh, facing the uh, city of Jerusalem, the old city of Jerusalem. You go down, uh, the Golden Gate is on this side. You go down the Kidron Valley and up the slope of the Mount of Olives. Okay. What does the word Gethsemane mean? Does anybody know? Gethsemane simply means an oil press. Right? An oil press. Now, does anybody know? Of course, you know, the, it makes sense because you've got the whole hillside there covered with olive trees. And what do you, uh, what do you, uh, what's one of the things that you can get from olives? Oh. Olive oil. And that's one of the, the big things that they use it for. Anybody know the process of getting oil from olives? Press. Okay, it's pressed, but before it's pressed, it's ground. They would, of course, then they would take these large stones and they would grind the olives into kind of a paste, and then they would press the oil out of them. Okay, that is such a fitting illustration of what Messiah was going through. In in, in that garden there, I'm talking spiritually speaking now, he was being ground up and he was being pressed, right? And the life was going to be pressed right out of him. If it had not been for, in Luke 21, or I think it's 21, 22, Luke 22, um, what does, how, did, how does God respond to this grinding and this pressure that comes on the Messiah in the garden? What does, what does the Father know is going to happen if he, does, if he just stays away? If the Father does nothing, He's going to die right there. Okay? But why can't the Father let him die right there? Now, after all, he's, he's shedding blood. He's because sweating he blood. Right? At a certain place. He's sweating blood. Why can't the Father let him die there? He needs to be at the right time and the right place. Okay, timing, the timing is the time and location. It has to be the right time, it has to be the right place. If he's the true Passover lamb, that means he's going to yield up his life at 3 p.m., which is the time of the evening offering, the time of the Passover lamb offering, and it has to be uh, a certain, it has to be on the 14th of Nisan, right, on, the, on that particular uh, Passover, and it has to be the right location as well. So the Father cannot allow him to succumb right there, and so what does he do? Luke chapter 22 records that God sends an angel there to strengthen him. Okay, to strengthen him. I've got down here, Gethsemane means oil press. Tragically, a perfect definition of the Savior's experience there in that olive grove. To obtain oil from olives, they're, they're ground into a paste and then the oil is pressed out through extreme pressure. This is exactly what was taking place with Christ there in the garden. The very, the very same thing. Okay, Now, in the opening of this seal there, it says that the, um, it goes on to talk about not only the balances, right? What is this, this uh, understand? What, what do we understand about the balances there? What choice and decision was, was Messiah making there? He, he's the one that was making a choice. The balances were in his hand, in the writer's hand, right? And so he's making a determination here. What's he, what's he, what's, what, what does he have to... What does he have to choose? To obey God. He has to choose to trust his Father, even though, as a man, he cannot see how in the world this is going to work out. Okay? He can't see. Um, John hears a voice from the sanctuary, from the midst of the four living beings. And, of course, this is the one that has the face of a man, which is important. A measure, a portion of wheat and barley for a penny. <clears throat> and, of course, that measure is uh, simply is the word uh, cloinix. And it's a dry measure containing uh, four <clears throat> cotylae or two centerae, centerae, which is less than a quarter a liter. Okay, so it's a very small amount, right? It's about as much as would support a, a soldier for a day. Okay. In fact, not even for a day, right? Um, so what what are we to understand about this? You know, why is this being brought into the thing? 
into the equation with this rider who's holding up the, the, the balances there. The message from the sanctuary is clear. A day's worth of provisions are being presented here. The rider on this horse, on this black horse, is only going to have this day, this moment in time to make his decision. Right? He's not going to be able to say, okay, guys, give me a break here. I need to just step away and go for a, you know, get some time to sort all this out, to see how, how this can, can work. No. He has that moment in time, that particular day, to make his choice, to make his decision. It all comes down to the event in Gethsemane there. Now, he's asked his father three times, um, is there another way? Which, which tells you that that's his humanness crying out, that I don't see how this is going to work. Okay? Why, is, why, would he, why would Jesus, in fact, what I've written down here is that... Uh, um, of course, Revelation, not Revelation, but John chapter 12, the same John that wrote Revelation, he wrote in chapter 12 of his gospel, um, Christ's own words, talking about this particular time you would come to. Now is my time troubled, or my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this hour came I unto the world. So he knew that his role was to be the Passover lamb, the sacrifice. Okay? But why is he troubled? <coughs> In fact, he, he's, he's pleased. Father, glorify thy name. And then a voice comes from heaven. An audible voice comes from heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. This is the heavenly assurance that the plan is on track. But the son must simply trust his father. Okay? But what's the question mark that Jesus would have in his mind? Why, why is this causing him such... I mean, not only the separation from his father... But to be separated is one thing, right? But it's another thing to think, is this separation going to make the difference for humanity? Is this plan going to be successful, right? So he's got these, he's got these doubts in, 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 ter in terms of the decision that he has to make, right? <clears throat> um, I've written a little bit of it this way. I can see the question on his face. How is my blood going to be applied to the place of atonement? In other words, I, I, I'm fine with being the, the offering. But not only must I be the offering, not, not only must I die, but my blood must then be applied to the mercy seat. Right? And so I can see him questioning, uh, how is that going to happen? We, we don't even know where the Ark of the Covenant is. Right? It's been lost for 600 years. So, in his mind, I think he was thinking, how, how is the, the protocols of the sanctuary... Remember, remember, he was the reality. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Okay? Which, which addressed all three entrances to the sanctuary. That's what they were called. You know? So, he's thinking... I'm going to give my life, but then how is the, it's impossible for me then as the priest, if I'm dead, to make an application of my blood. And, and the Jews are rejecting me. They're certainly not going to come and make that application. And we don't even know where the Ark of the Covenant is anyway. So you, can, you, can you see how stressful and, and disconcerting this would be in his mind? You know, how is the plan going to be successful? And, and what's the Father saying the whole time? The Father is basically saying, you just need to trust me. You just need to trust me. You know? I mean, everything, everything that he humanly could see and perceive said to him, this can't work. This can't even work. You know? So you, I hope that gives you a better perspective of uh, his experience there in that, in that garden there. Um, I think this is why there was so much stress and in the, in, in, in the reason why he was going to die right there. Okay? He was going to die right there. Um, the Desire of Ages, let me read, read a quote from Desire of Ages. In that text where the angel comes is Luke twenty two forty three, But uh, this is out of Desire of Ages. It says, With the issues of the conflict before him, 
Christ's soul, and here he is, that's, that's him holding the balances in his hand. Christ's soul was filled with dread of separation from God. Satan told him that if he became the surety for a sinful world, the separation would be eternal. I can't even imagine that, what, what that would mean to him. Uh, he would be identified with Satan's kingdom. He would never more be one with God. And what was to be gained by the sacrifice? In other words, it may not even accomplish what we're trying to accomplish here. It may not even be successful in securing humanity to my Father. How hopeless appeared the guilt and ingratitude of men. In his hardest features, Satan pressed the situation. That's that, there's that pressing in the wine press. The situation upon the Redeemer. The people who claim to be above all others in temporal and spiritual advantages have rejected you. Talking about the Jews there. The ones that you came for. Specifically, your people that you've come for, they, they're rejecting you. They're seeking not, not only rejection, but they're seeking to destroy you. The foundation, the center and seal of the promises made to them as a, a particular people. One of your own disciples who has listened to your instruction and has been among the foremost in church activities will betray you. One of your most zealous followers will deny you. All will forsake you. Christ's whole, I mean, you can imagine that these are the thoughts that the, the devil is, is, is urging upon him. So his whole being becomes abhorred at the thought that, though he, that those whom he had under, undertaken to save, those whom he had loved so much, meaning the disciples specifically, should unite in the plots of Satan, that pierced his soul. The conflict was terrible, more than terrible. Its measure was the guilt of his nation of his accusers and betrayer, the guilt of a world lying in wickedness. The sins of men weighed heavily upon Christ, and the sense of God's wrath against sin was crushing out his life. He was going to die right there. That's, that's what was going to happen. God would spare his son from this place for a specific reason, not only right time, right place. <clears throat> the application of the blood was scripted to take place somewhere else, and so the Father would allow him to take the ride on the pale horse, the ride that would lead to Calvary. Okay. So it seems so clear to me that this black horse, the ultimate, the ultimate fulfillment of the opening of this seal that the Lamb opens is his human experience in Gethsemane. Uh, we will have our, at the end, we'll have our own time of trouble. There'll come another time of trouble in this world such as never was, right, for the world. His Gethsemane experience was his personal time of trouble that had never, ever occurred in, in time. Uh, we will go through something, we will have our own Gethsemane experience. It won't be nearly like what he went through, but we'll have a similar experience similar Gethsemane experience ourselves at the end. Okay. Um, we, we got time for one more? Yeah, you still got yeah. 10 minutes. Good. Okay. All right, so what's the next one? Um, well, since, uh, since I saw Ken, Ken, uh, flying eagle. Yeah, flying eagle. Okay. Yeah, that's an eagle, right? Okay, Revelation, this goes to chapter 7, I'm mean, sorry, chapter 6, verse 7, when he opened the fourth, and when it says when he opened the fourth seal, who's the he? Jesus. Jesus. That's Jesus, okay, so again, Jesus is opening all these seals. I heard the voice from the four living creatures say, come and see, so I looked and beheld a pale horse. Now let's stop right there a minute, because you see I've put green down there, right? A lot of people, particularly those who follow the traditional uh, viewpoint ap ap application. They they want to say pale. They want to describe pale as being kind of a yellowish, greenish tinted type thing. Yeah, okay, Oli kind of a sickly looking green, uh, kind of a pea green. Um, 
and, and, they, and they're, they're doing that for a specific reason. But actually, the word for for pale that's translated pale there is the word chlorius. Uh, okay, um, chlorius. I think it's Cl yeah, chlorius. Yeah, chlorius is where we get our word chlorophyll from. Okay? The Greek word chlorius is where we get our word chlorophyll. Now, what does chlorophyll mean? Chlorophyll means green. Okay, a vibrant green, not not a pale. In fact, um, it's only when you take the life out of a plant. If you go and you pull a leaf or you pull a plant out of the ground and it's nice and green, you know, the foliage on it, it's only once you disconnect it from, from its, uh, its uh, vital force or its life <clears throat> that it starts to turn pale green and eventually shrivels up and turns brown. <clears throat> Next, there are two Greek words that give us chlorophyll, but the first part of it, <clears throat> chloeus, is uh, the Greek word for pale. <clears throat> Literally means green. Okay? <clears throat> not, not yellow green or, or green. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> okay, so you got a pale horse. And who's the rider? Death. Okay, the, the rider is identified as death. <clears throat> What's our word here? Strength. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Hades followed with him. Power was given to them. Hades is what? What's the word Hades there? What does that mean? Grave. It means the grave. Right? So the rider is death. The grave follows him. Power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with a sword, with hunger, with death, <clears throat> and by the beast of the earth. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, what's the main? What do you think the main focus is in this particular? <clears throat> Death. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Hell followed him. It's all, it's all about the grave and death. Yeah. I mean, the very rider is death. <clears throat> the very rider is death. He said for me to take a picture of the board before it gets erased. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, didn't even <laughs> I know, but, but it's hard to see from the from the camera angle, and especially oh, with it? that red with that red marker not being There's very good. The font. The rest of it looks like it comes across okay. The okay, so let's talk about this. <clears throat> we know that that Christ goes to Calvary and that he dies with Calvary, and yields up his life. Okay. <clears throat> we know that he would need an incredible amount of strength and of course he gets that strength from the angel that's just given it to him in Gethsemane okay. <clears throat> so he's got divine strength there <clears throat> there seems like there's a dichotomy between this watch this now Seems like there's a dichotomy between this right here, the main focus, and the color of the horse. All right? When you think of death in the grave, do you think green? What do you think of when you think green? Life. You think of life. Okay? Life is about, but yet here's death in the grave <coughs> as the main focus. That's the rider. All right? So how does death in the grave end up really being reflective of life? Because of the victory over death? 
Okay. <clears throat> yeah, because eventually there would be, he would be victorious over death. And it's because of his death, he took that, his death was the ransom aspect of his offering. Remember there would be, <clears throat> you'd have the ransom aspect and you'd have the atonement aspect. So the ransom aspect of Calvary occurs, which then gives every human being what, the possibility of what? Life. Life. Okay. So you can see how this is coded in a way, but it all fits together. You wouldn't expect this horse to be a horse that represented life. You would expect it to represent death, but yet by dying, he becomes life. Now, what about the <clears throat> eagle? Is that something to do with being free? <clears throat> um, Maybe being free from sin? <clears throat> it, what do eagles do? They fly. They soar. They soar, right? They soar over <clears throat> a vast amount of territory. You know, that's what really occurred here. I mean, when he was resurrected, it was as, if, as though his spirit was soaring because they had gained the victory. So again, even with these angel uh, depictions, all of them are significant, you see, in representing what the Messiah would do. And I think there's a point to that being that it says... <clears throat> the horses are reflective of what he would do. The, the, the words are reflective of what he would need to do them, you see. <clears throat> now, when you look at, um, <clears throat> I've got, I got some scriptures here to talk more about, <clears throat> about this, but uh, <clears throat> I've got down here chlorophyll. Um, chlorophyll actually absorbs red light and blue light in the uh, wavelength scale from sun. In the sun, what's reflected, right, is the green light. So that's why plants and tr and, and things that are growing are ref they're reflecting the green light, right? They're absorbing the blue and the red, and they're reflecting the others. <clears throat> Chlor Chloros is used that Greek word because of what would be reflected in the death of the rider. What would be reflected? And the death of the rider is life. And so that's why it's green. You see? <clears throat> that's why it's green. Um, I was going to say as well, the, the Bible talks about where the eagles are gathered, there shall the carcasses be. I think that's in Luke or Matthew. Yeah. In relation now, to how the eagle relates to death. I put scripture text down for all of these things over here, like Luke 24. <clears throat> and uh, Isaiah 53, of course, is a good one. To read about um, <clears throat> Messiah's mission and what he would accomplish. I mean, he came to give us victory over sin, and his his his, his life of service would confront the world. He would take peace from the world. His experience at Gethsemane was like none other. It was it was typified by the black horse, the darkness that he would have to experience. He's making a choice. He's making a decision. All humanity is weighed in the balance in Gethsemane. Gethsemane is where the spiritual victory over sin and death occurred. The garden tomb is where the physical victory over sin and death occurred, where he was resurrected. So you got those two gardens being very significant. And of course, a Calvary here. <clears throat> Chloe's, <clears throat> Chloe's would be the words that would just perfectly identify what took place at Calvary. Now the other thing I wanted to share with you <clears throat> was that last part. It talks about um, uh, and the name of him sounds was death. He, okay, And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with a sword, with hunger, with death, and by the sword, <clears throat> etc. That yes. could only identify one particular power. Because Dan it says, said a comment that it's the last step before the application of his blood. That time that you were just talking about. Yes, this right here? Yeah. Yeah, that would occur at Calvary. So I'm having to go back and forth since the <clears throat> laptop is not coming up. Right. You could use that on your computer. No, he's using the chat mode on Facebook and stuff, so it's, it's confusing. 
Um, I got this from a PBS special in the Roman Empire of the first century. Who put Christ on the cross? Romans. The Romans did. Okay. Well, I mean, they're, they're the, Rome, the, I mean, they physically put him up there. Yeah, they're the, they're the ones that physically put him up there, right? The Jews are the ones that spiritually the put him up there. The Jews are the ones that spiritually put him up there, exactly. Okay. Yeah. 2,000 years ago, the, <clears throat> the world was ruled by Rome from England to Africa and from Syria to Spain. One in every four people on earth lived and died under Roman law. And what does this text say? It says, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth. Here you have a fourth of, during the time of Christ, 25% of the people that lived, right, were under Roman rule. Of the known <clears throat> world. Of the known world, yeah. Well, the Romans uh, put him on the cross. But the Jewish people convicted him, uh, didn't they? They're the ones they that brought him. They, They're the they, ones that were pushing it, yeah. They were pushing it, and then they said, we don't have a king except Caesar. Right. The Roman Empire in the first century AD mixed sophistication with brutality and could suddenly <coughs> lurch from civilization, strength and power, to terror, tyranny, and greed. The world population at that time was around 250 million. One quarter of the world's population resided in the Roman Empire. But to live there was a risk. Okay? And I went through, and in the little publication that I put out, I, I put several examples, a couple of examples of uh, things that took place in the Roman Empire. It was really a time... Um, a, a, an incredible risky time to live under Roman rule uh, because of the people. What, what, what was one of the things that was happening in the Roman Empire that caused <clears throat> kind of a, uh, an insanity, almost a, 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 an insane, normal... Yeah, right, they were getting, they had lead pipes for water and they were getting, uh, this was leaching into the water and they were drinking this, uh, kind of poisoning them, their minds on a daily basis with lead. And so uh, they were going kind of insane, and their, their culture really reflected the insanity of the decisions and choices that they made. At least they grown for copper pipes. <clears throat> they eventually changed. I mean, it's absolutely astounding when you go through, when you go through and look at some of these things that took place. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I don't want to take the time to read all, all you know, these different ones that I've written out here. Let me just go back right here. Uh, it says, what a fitting description by John, who had been living through the madness as a first century citizen of Rome. Um, and of course, John himself, they tried to get rid of him a couple of times, boil him in oil and so forth. He had, of course, the, the amphitheater, the Roman Colosseum, where they had the regular sporting event of throwing people to the lions and stuff. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> you know, you, you go and you go to the Coliseum, you're not watching a football game or anything like that. You're watching people being torn apart by animals. I mean, how bizarre. I mean, you know, I mean, you'd have to be insane or mad to, to think that was entertainment. Well, we do it today, don't we? It's about television. <laughs> well, we do, we, we are more sophisticated in how we tear people apart today. We do them when they're babies, right? <laughs> tear them apart through abortions and so yeah. forth. So we're more sophisticated and we don't publicize it and we don't sell tickets to go and sit around and watch it per se. We just don't capitalize on it. You know, yeah, okay. <laughs> but I mean, we have enough nonsense going on now that uh, we're, we're killing more people ourselves as a supposedly sophisticated society than they ever did through the Dark Ages. They killed, you know, <clears throat> 80 70 to 100 million people were martyred through the Dark Ages, but that was over a period of 1,260 years. Uh, we're killing 5,000 people a day. <laughs> Just add that up, you know. And, I mean, it's far worse. Absolutely staggering. <clears throat> Presentation of the fourth horse and rider seems so brutal, so final, yet the word close, translated as pale, is intentionally and tremendously relevant. Chlorophyll is also <clears throat> several related green pigments found in 
kind bacteria and chloroplasts of algae and plants. Its name is derived from the Greek words uh, chloros meaning green and philion meaning leaf. Chlorophyll is essential in photosynthesis, allowing plants to absorb energy from light. What a sermon from science is here presented and indicated by the loosening of the fourth seal. The light from the Father allowed the Son to yield his life, yet the, yet the slain rider is on a green horse. That same light cut off to the rider produces now an abundance of energy and life. The death of the rider, Messiah, now exposes the horse more fully, revealing the full rays of light from the Father. The death of the Messiah allowed humanity the possibility to receive the life-giving element of life and eternal life. So, um, it seems obvious to me that what you have going on with these first four seals that are being unloosened are ultimately, we can make applications in history, I'm well aware of that, <clears throat> but I think that we can see specifically that the ultimate fulfillment applies to the one who is actually opening the seal, and that's the Messiah, of his, <clears throat> his, call, to, his call to mission, which would have been, which would have been his uh, uh, victory over temptation in the wilderness temptations, his three and a half years of ministry, where he confronts the world with light, dispelling the darkness, which is going to be uh, <clears throat> very chaotic. His Gethsemane experience is very fittingly described by the black horse and his ride to Calvary by the green horse. So, does that make sense to everybody? Well, it's beginning to make sense now, but I never did get nothing like that out of it when I read it before. <laughs> what we've read is the historical, what we've read is that the seals, and I can read it right out of the book here, um, here here's one here, uh, uh, unfolding the Revelation, Roy Allen Anderson. This is the typical, uh, one of the typical viewpoints for the historic application, where the seals are um, covering the same period of time that the messages to the seven churches, and also their contention is that the trumpets also um, <clears throat> covering the same period of time, but. The, the trumpets, in, in my, in my, uh, according to the, in, in the context, if we're going to really stay within the context of Revelation, the trumpets are yet future. They're not in the past. They're yet future. So, uh, and in the near future. So. <clears throat> and we just got more seals to go. Yeah, we still have three more seals to go. And again, be thinking about how did they specifically relate to the mission of the Messiah. Okay. Um, so, it's only until we get to the sixth seal that the traditionalists, I would call them, the traditional view, actually catches up to the ultimate fulfillments. Okay. And it really has to because you only have a certain amount of time to, that you're dealing with. Okay. But I think this is these first four specifically. I think are more um, the experience that the Messiah himself would would go through. And of course, the last three also apply to him. So we'll uh, ultimately we'll pick those up next week. So, very good. <clears throat> but anyway, continue reading through. <clears throat> uh, look at different um, perspectives, but. For, for sure, I want you to see the relevance of what I think is the ultimate fulfillment of the opening of the seals. <clears throat> so we all good? <clears throat> and we'll keep this up on the board and we'll just follow the same format on the last three as well. I don't know if we'll have time to get through all three of them next week, but we'll, uh, we'll do as many as we can. Okay. Just keep plugging away. <clears throat> All right, let me invite you to bow your heads and we'll close our time out in prayer. Father in heaven, we want to thank you and praise you for uh, how incredible your word is and that, that you're willing to share with us all of these particulars, but especially at this time in earth's history that 
that reveals specifically uh, how involved uh, you and the Son were in the salvation of humanity. So important for us to, to see the, these ultimate fulfillments as opposed to a lot of the traditional thinking that takes our minds back uh, thousands, hundreds, and, and even a thousand years, two thousand years in history. And Father, may, may, may our minds be drawn to the incredible plan that you had and the sacrifice that would be involved with your Son and with yourself in accomplishing salvation for us. And let us let our, let our lives be a testimony of that tremendous sacrifice. And, and we pray that you will use our influence to, to touch other lives, to take peace from our own neighborhoods as, as only your spirit can do in bringing conviction and confrontation to all those around us. Time is of the essence. So we pray, Lord, that you will use us in a speedy fashion um, to bring light to dispel the darkness. And we're thanking you for using us. Uh, we're not worthy, but you've called us. And so we're responding to the call. Now empower and strengthen us is our prayer, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Also, we pray, Lord, a blessing on the food that we're going to partake of, and, of course, our fellowship for the remainder of the day. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen and amen. Amen. Okay, so hopefully uh, putting it on the board here helps uh, you guys with uh, uh, reasoning through the different particulars. Um, like I said, I can make available the article that uh, we've written here about a 40-page, 35-40 page article <laughs> will uh, <clears throat> we'll fill in a lot of the, the gaps that we don't have time to read through all of it. Um, extra scriptures and so forth that you, you might want to consider. So thanks for that, and thank you for joining us again. I hope that uh, you got a lot out of it, and that you'll join us next week again, same time, same place. Until then, have a great week. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>